you know, most often, I don't, or I, I try not to consult my people about what's real and what's true. Some things Mr. Lindsay said are too important to consult our people. But every now and then, I like to feel what I know is true. I know all of that's true. I know it because it's not only knowledgeable from Scripture, but because it's experiential with the truth. Everybody doesn't know that. There's some people that have head knowledge about the truth. That's not saving knowledge. You can knowledge mentally <coughs> be aware of the truth. But truth is to be experienced. People have, like to say, well, we all talk about experience. Yeah, because the Bible promises it. It says, love God, in fact, the command is love God with your mind, your heart, your soul, your strength. That's your entire being. There are times people come that make me want to take a lap when I go to the gym. I'd almost pay him money if he would take me a lap when I go here. I'd be probably lost here. Because that joker is wild. He doesn't do that every Sunday. But his people know him real well. Plus, it's on live feed. Those who don't know him, that's a trip. When I ministered the last time, we started that basic introduction to what we're going to talk about for a few weeks because this leads into some serious teaching matter. Uh, what happens when a sinner believes? We finished Hebrews. We talked to the... I see body language all over here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Can you say anything? It's like a home group. We're glorified home group. Got a beautiful building. Well, what, what's up, Lizzie? You can't look at me and go... us correctly what is grace. You can't talk about 
what happens when a uh, sinner believes without talking about grace. You can't talk about what happens when a believer sins without talking about grace. Everything in this book is grace-based. So it's, I, I, some of you have probably been in the church uh, many, 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 like me, many, many, many years. No doubt if you've heard some crazy teaching that you feel like you kick it out. But some of us haven't. And then some of us that have been in there a long time haven't listened at times. And so we have gaps in our belief. I remember the curriculum when we started our little daycare up in Hogansville, Fort Surprise. We went from a daycare to a school early childhood, and we ordered the ACE curriculum, Accelerated Christian Education. And then when we moved to LaGrange, we went full high school. But every student had to be tested to find out their gaps in their learning. If they were to do it today, most people in high school would be in the sixth or seventh grade or lower, according to the stats that are coming out. Just this week, they said in some school systems, they're graduating with less than sixth grade education. Uh, in today's thing, not old school. Old school was higher, not much. So they're virtually, you can't read a lot of things. But ACE would give, would give a test, and we'd find their gaps in math, English, different subjects. So we would have to order what's called a PACES, a packet of accelerated Christian education. They would have to go back and do that work in order to catch up to what, what they missed when they were in the government schools. Mm -hmm. And in the church, if we were to do that, we would have to go back and fill up the gaps. And we got 52 times a year that I have to minister to you. And then uh, we take vacations. Uh, Lord willing, we're going to take one in November to see my daughter in her farm. So it's appropriate. Then we we had COVID. Uh, we had people that didn't come during when we, when we gathered. Then we have you get sick, you miss, and uh, even though we live stream, there are people that don't take advantage of that to keep their the gaps and they're more narrow. So I'm going to spend some time in closing some gaps and at the same time uh, helping us understand to recognize error. And so we'll teach truth so you can not try to point out that time. What is error? It's vital. I want to tell you it's vital to understand that we address these. I sent out a thing to a few people to help me pray. We had a, I was looking for a painter. I needed a front porch, back porch painter. Actually, Regina was the one that really wanted that painting. I just agreed with her. And she's happy today. And so I called a guy that I got in touch with him, and he, 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 he wouldn't even respond. The one that I knew, he was a good painter. So all of a sudden, this thing, I believe it's Providence. What's Providence? Somebody tell me what Providence is. Take a laugh. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good doctrine right there. That's right. It's where God orders our steps, sets us up, does things for his purpose and his glory. We just simply get to walk into it and it happens. So Providential comes up on my messenger name, their painters said, we can give free estimates. And I saw the review, looked at some of the stuff. So I got in touch with a guy. He comes out and gives me an estimate. He's, he's from uh, Guatemala. He's not Domingo, but he's really good. I had Domingo doing plumbing and tearing out a floor. And so it was a divine appointment. Providence is simply God gives you a divine appointment when he gives you the opportunity. So I'm going to pray. I'm praying. <laughs> for up to nine years been to Mexico and done a conference I, I really do and we have a great opportunity with what's going on the church while it angers us that people can break into the country it's illegal that our government allows it you need to understand if I was on that side of the border I'd be one of those people but that doesn't mean I sanction that it just means if I was Honduras was the highest murder capital in the world not long ago I'd be beating a path to get out of there and if you're honest you would too. I've had people staunchly against keeping it illegal, and yet that was Terry, my brother. He said, Richard, I don't like it. I don't think it's right, but you need to know if I'm down there, I can beat the path. And I, I'm 
just being honest. There's no way that I'm going to stay there. Because uh, you get killed down there real quick. So, uh, I don't know why I said that. Oh, Hector, thank you. I appreciate it. That's my external hard drive over there. Uh, <laughs> so, he and this lady come, and the young men, and we started talking. And I looked at him, and he said something. I said, Hector, I trust that he he just went wide open with me in a conversation and started talking to me. And later, he opened his world to me. And he told me some of the details that I sent to a few of you that I, I believe he actually prayed because he's, he, he has enough. His, he didn't know his parents. He had no parents. Four years old, he was basically without parents. And so he was on his own. And But for a few years, when he was little, and then his grandmother she would make him read scripture every day at 4 o'clock to help him sleep. He said she would not let us go play in the yard until he said, we read this. We had to read this. We didn't have an option. He said one time he made a mistake. He said, I really don't feel like it right now. He didn't do that. <laughs> Grandma made him read that book. Made him like it. So he's got enough. He's a serious God boy. And then that evening, they really opened up. Both of them did. And I'm not going to go into all the Trust me. I'm going to believe for that. I'm going to believe God strengthens him to follow up on his word. You help me. Because I got to share Jesus with them. And one of the first things you start talking about is grace. You, you don't, you start talking about grace. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. And so I didn't go into detail. I didn't have time. They were working. Uh, but needless to say, we communicated since they finished up last week. I'll be meeting with them. And so you. Here's our prayer. We want a multiracial congregation. I pray that everything that's in the kingdom should be represented right here with God. Which is going to lead me to make a statement before I go into my introduction. I made a statement the other Sunday that I felt the pushback. And I did it uh, because I made something like that statement before. I know where people are. And I know our own biases. And I know that there are prejudices that all races have against all people groups. I've lived in a, out in Dallas, pastored in a Hispanic, uh, black, white, and then other races, and they all had issues with each other. So it's not one group. It's all groups until Jesus comes in and takes over. Then he has to deal with that. And he will. Uh, but I made a statement a few years back. I said, Everyone is welcome. The other Sunday I said, homosexual, trans, I felt the pushback. I want you to know this morning. I'm going to clarify. I want you to know if something rose up in you, you've forgotten why you got saved and how you got saved. You have. You just flat forgot because you think you were good enough to be saved. I wasn't good enough. Now, if it offends you, get over it, take it to the cross. Listen to me. None of you were good. No, not one, said God. God will save a homosexual in a minute. I know that's living right today. A trans went to school with me at Christ for the Nation. Uh, he's got a book called Perry Desmond. You need to get this old. Serve Jesus till the end of his days. He didn't reverse the surgery because of the expense, but he lived for Christ with great people uh, till he died. Love God. Worship God. So you need to know, if you, if you, if he kicks up, say, well, we don't want them coming here. You're in the wrong congregation. Jesus said, let them all come, as many as will, and take of the water of life freely. If that, if you got a barrier as to who can and who can't, you may need to get saved. Right? Or you may need to get saved from sin. Because you got sin in your life. So, now let me qualify. I said something like that on Sunday morning. It's critical what I'm going to be teaching on. This isn't just filler. We were in that house over there, uh, the school there, years ago, and I made a statement. All are welcome to come, but not 
not stay that way. You hear that qualifier? All are welcome to come, but not stay. In our congregation, minister, missionary, left the church one time. Because he wanted to be able to come and just stay. No, no, I preached the gospel until I changed. So if you think there was a time that we were reaching people, you've heard me tell this, I got, I got to say it, you'll qualify what I said to you. Uh, or you'll think I don't want woke. <laughs> I'm not. I'm anti abortion. I'm pro everything that God's pro, and I'm anti almost everything God's against. And most of what's being propagated today is against God. Uh, even Kanye West knows that. Yay, Kanye West. You've seen anybody here see his interview? Raise your hand. He got more boldness than most Christians. He said it's demonic. I got on his team. Then I don't know what to think about him. I have a hard time following most of it. I got anyway. Uh, let me just say this. Paul wrote and said, and such as be in this world. I want to get the word of the man in you and I want to share his word of that gospel. Let me pray for you. I appeal to your conscience and let you become like the great Chuck Morey and Joe Francis. Let it be in your heart. Let it be in your mouth. Let it be in your mind. And then say it. They expect to be loved. So whoever comes on rational riches without faith or fear will come to God. Okay? Yeah. We need to know. Yeah. All are welcome to come. Yeah. But not stay. Because eventually the gospel will run your life. It runs Christians off. So let me get back. Everybody understand? All right. We happy? So y'all thought I done gone woke, did you? Uh-huh. <laughs> 48 years, I'm too tired, too old, too grumpy to become anti-biblical. And I've gone to places, wow, I did a lot of things, I just want to kill my people. Have you opened up like that yet? Have yeah. you ever noticed that you start getting older, you start thinking, I'll give you 50 stuff. Well, I think that I don't really care what you think. So what? Your thoughts stink sometimes like mine. Anyway, now, that's still it. Let's talk about this. Uh-oh. Say Amen. Okay, I'll do my best. Give you time sense. So I'm going to put it in fragments so we can get it. Colossians chapter 1. This is where we started, but we're going to go deeper. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. We're talking about the grace of God in all its truth. Say all. all. Colossians chapter 1. And I'm, try to, I'm going to do something, not preach. I'm going to try to teach and just try to stay safe. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, or for the young ones, giants, eat thieves, and carrots. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1. Now this is going to be uh, topogenical. I mentioned that to you. We're not going verse by verse in this book. We're just going to use the topic and work with some text. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 5. this, because of the hope which is laid up for you where? In heaven. Of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel. You need to know there, Paul said there are other gospels. He said there's another Jesus, there's another gospel. And so, this is the truth of the gospel. Verse 6. Which has come to you, the church at Colossae, as it has also in all the world. Now, um, you ought to underline that phrase as in all the world because Jesus said go into all the world and Paul's saying the gospel is known into all the known world. All right? And is bringing forth fruit. This is the truth of the gospel. As it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Okay. Just by that one verse, that last phrase, the grace of God in truth, what does that tell you? Derive from that. You've come to know the grace of God in truth. This is not a trick question. I'm trying to get a response. The grace of God in truth. What's the opposite of that? Yeah, the grace of God in untruth. So I want you to see he's writing 
to help us understand. The Ten Commandments start out, you know, uh, or has in there, thou shalt not steal. Well, he did the negative because he was emphasizing the positive. Don't take what belongs to other people. It's their private property. Preserve it. Protect it. Don't commit adultery. Be loyal in your marriage. Be faithful in your marriage. Don't cheat on one another. Uh, take care of your spouse. That's the positive. But he starts out with this. Now, he starts out on the positive, and I'm wanting you to see the negative. All right? The grace of God and all its truth. Okay? So, it is vital to understand that to address those two questions that I mentioned, we must always begin with the gospel of grace and do so in a way that's biblically and contextually informed. Grace, the term is used 150 times in the New Testament. So if there's anything you know, it needs to be grace. But it needs to be in all its truth. A lot of people believe in grace, but not in all its truth. I've been accused of not being a grace teacher. Because I believe in grace in all its truth. You see, if you just know it in one single aspect, and then you operate in another expression of it, which I'm going to show you. People say, well, you're hard. You're, you, you, you shouldn't do that. Well, I'm commanded to do certain things. I'm, I'm going to obey this, but and it's grace. It may sound like I am a grace teacher. I am a grace minister. I absolutely minister grace. But in all its truth, I can't pick one aspect. I'll show you what that means. This word is used 150 times in the New Covenant. Contextually, we have to see that it's nuanced. It's 150 times, but it's used differently in different texts to show the different meanings, the nuance, the different shades of meaning of the word grace. It's one term that Paul sums up the entire expression of the doctrine of grace, of, of, of the promises of God. One term is so pregnant it has various shades of meaning. In fact, the NIV says this, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing among you since the day you heard and understood grace in all its truth. Uh, NIV, I believe, says grace in its various forms. I mentioned this in our introduction. The varied grace of truth. Very different forms. In other words, grace has different expressions of how you understand it. And so we need to understand. Let me give you just a quick review of how to use it. I just put together. There's saving grace in Ephesians 2. There's strengthening grace in 2 Corinthians 10. There's instructional grace in Titus 2. There's conquering grace according to James 4. There's evidentiary grace in 2 Corinthians 9. There's growing in grace in 2 Peter. There's helping grace in Hebrews 4. There's gifts of grace in 1 Corinthians. The one thing they have in common, and they're all different. You define the word different because of its context. It's all the one thing they have in common is this: it's always unmerited. Say unmerited. unmerited. Grace has to start with unmerited, unearned, undeserved. It is all. It's it's never less than that, but it's always more. It's used 150 times. You have to understand. It's a broad term, but a small word that's packed full of the riches of God's grace. And then you have the warnings. 2 Corinthians 6, 1, do not receive the grace of God in vain. Galatians 2, 21, don't nullify, make void the grace of God. Hebrews 10, don't slander, insult the spirit of grace. See, grace works by the spirit of God. And then Jude 4 says, some were perverting the grace of God. So you've got all these promises of the manifold grace of God. Then you have these warnings about grace, and that's where we don't teach. Those so-called hyper-grace guys, they land over here, and they'll do on one aspect. I just listen to one do it. It's horrible. It's horrible. You know what a church allows and promotes? If you allow immorality, if you allow stuff, you're promoting it. People will do it. Look what our government's doing. What they're allowing on the borders, what they're allowing in the schools, what they're allowing out in our culture and society, they're promoting it. Then turn around and say they're not. 
what you allow, you promote. You have to understand. It takes the full range of meaning, understanding it, to live for God. Now, when it says here, since you heard and understand or know the grace of God in all its various forms, the word is epinosoko, something that way. It basically means to gain full knowledge, to have full understanding, and fruit bearing evidence. Since they not only knew it, they experienced it. And it bore fruit in their lives when they understood the full range of God's grace in their lives. So, we understand that there's the promises of grace. And at the end of the day, here's what we're going to be talking about. Saving grace. Sanctifying grace. Say it with me. What's number one? Saving grace. Two? Sanctifying grace. That's where we're weak. That's where we're weak. You ever wonder why some Christians just absolutely look lawless, do what they want to when they want to, still believe they're saved, that they're living for God? It's because they've heard this saving. They've never been taught sanctifying grace. So, because this brings accountability. Serious accountability. And so, sanctif save, saving grace, sanctifying. How do people wind up like that? It's called a helicopter. One writer said it's a helicopter of coming in. You ever notice how helicopters can come in? They'll come into a place. And, and, and what do they usually do? They'll go down like this, right? And they sit down in one area. That's what ministers do. They'll go to the Bible, and they'll helicopter. They'll come in, they'll go around, they'll make you think they're going to work with the book, and they'll land on one text, and then the, everything they're going to say is that one, then they take off. They don't deal with the context. They don't deal with the full range of biblical theology. In other words, what else God says about it. They just deal with that one verse, and the people leave believing that's everything that the Bible has to say about that topic. That's the danger of topical preaching. Uh, so we do helicopter hermeneutic. That means interpretation. Fly in, land on one verse, and the people believe and hate it. So they come in, they'll take one verse on grace, and they'll preach it as if every time you see the word grace, that's all it means. So people go away, it's unmerited, it's unearned, it's undeserved, therefore... It don't matter how I live. I'm under grace. Crepo Dollar told the said to tell his congregation, you, you know, you're under grace, so people live immorally. They do stuff that's wrong. They lie. They, they do all kinds of stuff because they're under grace. So he was trying to exhort them that, you know, uh, you, you need to come out of that, but he never went to sanctifying grace, which holds him accountable. And he certainly wasn't going to hold him accountable. Uh, so, you got to remember the warnings as well as the promises. So you can't answer these two questions biblically without defining the gospel of grace and all its truth. When a sinner believes and when a believer sins. Now go to Titus. Let's work on this. Titus. You're not there yet? Now you're on my time. Come on. Titus chapter 2. Grace in all its truth. Say that. Somebody start talking to you about grace. Say, do you know it in all its truth? What you going to ask? Do you know it in all its truth? Because grace will not allow you to live like you want to. When you want to. If a person lives like this, the Bible calls that lawless. They are lawless. Grace will never cover lawlessness. Meaning, not living by God's commandments. Titus chapter 2. Let me show you. Here's where we get into I'm not, I, I don't have to spend too much time on uh, the saving grace as such. Uh, we, we know that. But watch this. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Powerful verse. When I saw this years ago, I, I was going to do a conference in the, up in the mountains of Jamaica with Franklin Graham. He asked me to come teach on grace. So, this is my jumping off point, verse 11. For the grace of God, say grace of God. Grace of God. I keep you awake with me. The grace of God that does what? Give me some different translations. Appear. 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 
appeared. Anybody else? There's other translations. I'll give you the other. All right, listen. <clears throat> For the grace of God that brings salvation. Where does salvation come from? According to that. Grace. When we get saved, you see, to talk about salvation, you've got to talk about grace. And so, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. So now then, we just see a different aspect of grace. You see, for the grace of God, next verse, for the grace of God does what? Say it. Yeah, this is a class today. I need participation. The grace of God does what? It instructs us. Other translation says, teaches us. So not only is grace unmerited favor, now we've moved into a different nuance. Paul says, grace instructs. That means it's going to tell us what to do. It's going to tell us when to do it. It's going to tell us what we ought to do. In other words, grace brings an ethic. Say ethic. The word ethic means an obligation. To say I'm saved by grace means I'm under obligation. It's unmerited, but I'm obligated. The grace was is free to me, but it wasn't free to God. He freely gives it, and then he puts an obligation with it. This is the part that Christianity is missing. So uh, the grace of God brings salvation. New Living Translation said the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation. The grace of God has been revealed. What it do? It brings salvation. And I believe the grace of God has appeared. You know, New King James brings. So the word bring. Words are important in the Bible. In fact, when it says all scripture is divinely inspired, uh, the Greek literally is this. Every single word. Jesus used it like this. Every jot and tittle. Every fine abbreviation. Every fine was divinely inspired. There's, it's, there's nothing in here that's minimal. So we can't focus on one part. So the grace of God, the word brain there in the New King James, it goes to the Greek word, means to, to bring about. Now look at this. The grace of God that brings salvation, brings about salvation. Grace isn't just a, a what's the term? passive stance. Grace isn't passive. It doesn't mean that God just looks at us no matter what we do and always with favor. Grace now is active. That's the first thing you need to take away. Grace is active. It means to bring about, to effect the gospel's promised outcome. Whatever God requires, he will bring it about. His word will bring it about by grace because grace is active. And what does it do? To bring about, to effect the gospel's promised outcome, it'll bring it into reality, experience. That's what grace does. If the gospel promises a new life, guess what grace will do? Effect it. It'll bring it about. So people who remain Christ, but there's no change in their life, haven't experienced saving grace. Now, I'm not talking about people. I'm not, we never become sinners. That's not even the goal to a resurrection. Now, you over there close. <coughs> but we become sinning less. I'm going to say that again. We'll never become sin less. But we will be becoming sin less, less, less. That's what sanctification is. Salvation is our sins are forgiven. Sanctification is where he ongoingly deals with our sin. The blood cleanses, but sanctification works on us. And in this sense, it brings about the righteousness that God is here in this question. This is a great one. Somebody here was here ago. I think it was no, I can't remember the other guy's name. He died. He was he was a tremendous preacher. It's not going to be you, it's just Randy. <laughs> I've been you and I'm Randy. Okay. This is the righteousness of God. This is you. When, through Jesus Christ, God sees us as white and clean. Right? That's salvation. That's why I said, seeing what Pastor Chuck said, I, I, what is the song? I know 
was who he said I was. An explorer of iniquity. I, I, I did. And I had a good family. I went to church. I went to the altar one time. Maybe more than one. Because you get understanding. You get under conviction when you get out. But I wasn't saved. What makes though I heard the gospel? I even memorized the gospel. I told you I learned John 3 16 when I was very young, and then in high school I thought I need to know more Bible, so I learned verse 17. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I learned that over there in Nelson Holmes apartments. I feel good about myself. I knew two Bible verses. That's enough to save a man. Those two verses, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not bear to have everlasting life. And God didn't send him to condemn him, but that through him I might have eternal life. Lord have mercy. Why did God have me do that? Memorize that. Because ultimately he was setting me apart to come to saving faith. But what makes that those words alive? Grace. See, grace is active. It's a powerful force. So when the gospel goes forth and we're chosen and God says, you today will bow your knee. Grace floods our heart as an active force and changes a person's heart and mind, especially their will that's been in bondage. We, Ephesians 2, we were dead in trespasses and sins, but God, by his mercy, say, how do you do it? Grace floods some kind of spirit-infused force activates life of resurrection in a dead man. Because we're dead in trespass and sin. What does it? Grace. So grace isn't just a passive looking of God, the way God looks at us. It's a powerful force that activates a God's command. He chooses whom he saves. You may not like that term, but it's very good. We just sang it. I am chosen. It doesn't say, I chose. It says, I am chosen. Paul writes in Corinthians, you know that not many of you who were chosen, chosen, he who had begun a good work in you, God starts it, he finishes it. That's his job. So anyway, a little good gospel. So grace is a posture. Give me, give me three things. Grace is a posture of how God looks at us. It's his posture, his attitude. He looks at us through Christ, sees Christ, and therefore declares us sinless, and he adopts us into his family, with the sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. And we become heirs of God, joint heirs with the Son, with the Son. So it's his, that's his posture. He positions himself. These are my people. This is my daughter. This is my family. They're part of my family. And it's unmerited, it's unearned, and it's undeserved. That's God's posture. Isn't that good? That's God's God posture. He looks at us like that. When, hey, any of y'all ever felt like this way? You ever come in on a Sunday morning feeling like, <clears throat> not me. I don't have that. You can tell people. You're perverting grace. You're frustrating grace. You're turning it into something else. You can't do that. Never get out from under that stuff. Okay, never get out from under that. I, I, I have. I've tried to run at times. Run to God, not from Him. Grace is never less. Let me give you three things. Grace is God's posture. I try to simplify it. I like to think it through and then regurgitate it to you. And so I've simplified this for me. I believe it'll help you. Grace is posture. It's unmerited favor, how God views it. Secondly, grace is position. Uh, Romans chapter 5. The grace in which we stand. That's how we stand in grace. I'm positioned in grace. I stand in the unmerited grace of God. That's important. So it's God's posture. It's my position. But however... Grace is power. It's whole life transformation. Grace is the power of God activated by His Spirit. When His Spirit begins to work, that's grace. You cannot, you cannot disconnect grace and the work of the Spirit because the work of the Spirit is God's grace activated. That's why Paul calls it, or Hebrews calls it, the Spirit of grace. The Spirit works through grace. Or when he works, it's grace. And that is grace's posture, grace's position, grace's power. That's grace in all its truth. 
Focus on one to the detriment of our lives. Focus on just two to the detriment of our lives. It has to be all three. Or we don't have the gospel of grace and all its truth. It's never less than unmerited favor, but it's always more. And if you do one without the other, you pervert it. That's the one. Yes. And in criminology, we, we learned that it's motive that connects the intent to the predicate yes. act. Yes. Very good. So it seems parallel to what you're it saying. Is. You're exactly right. Very good. Go ahead. That was it. <laughs> it's true. Motive connects intent to, exactly. to predicate act. That's why you'll hear it say it was sin, word, thought, or deed. Because that's pretty comprehensive. And so I'm always dealing with either the words, my thoughts, my deeds, motive. And that's called sanctification. And sometimes I don't feel good about it. Do you know I get frustrated with you folks sometimes? <laughs> I do. You're sheep. I'm a sheep. The biggest one I get frustrated with is me. You think I get frustrated with you when it comes down to the pulpit. You don't understand how talking to myself is frustrating. It's brutal. If I talk to you the way I talk to me, you wouldn't be here. Two, you wouldn't allow me to be here. I'm serious. My, my deal is dealing with the sanctification in my own life. Because about the time I get a victory in one area, then it blows my motive. When I get, feel like I'm getting victory in that area, then it blows my thought. I'm telling you, this thing up here is cruel. It's got to be renewed. It'll kill you. This thing will kill you if you don't get it renewed. Because you believe a lie. I mean, I, how many of you have ever believed a lie up here? Oh, yeah. And the but we're on the same page so far. Way too many ministers, preachers, teachers, employ helicopter hermeneutics when they only focus on grace and posture. So everybody feels good. And then they allow people to live in the way they want to because it's grace. That's perverted grace. So, if we employ it correctly, uh, they'll say you're saved. I'm going to. Raise your hand if you've ever heard you are saved in your sin. Anybody ever heard a preacher saying that? That's baptistic. Yeah. They'll say you're saved, right? Yeah. You're saved in your sin. Think about that. You're saved in your sin. So they always say, well, I'm a sinner. Sure, I did that. I'm a sinner. Oh, oh. Oh, well, this is why we're going to curse John. He that habitually practices sin does not know God. That's it. Look, if you don't know grace, you won't know what to do with that verse. He that knoweth God does not habitually practice sin without accountability. That's powerful. But then you promote it, you allow people to get the heart. Well, I'm just a saved sinner. Well, I understand what they're trying to articulate, but it's wrong. Because it's telling them that unmarried favor is God's posture. Therefore, you don't have a changed life. Sure, I did that. Yeah, I did that. Why, why wouldn't I do that? If I sin, doesn't God's grace abound? You know what Paul said? He was telling them the wrong. He said, God forbid. You can't go on sinning and grace be at work in your life. That's sanctification. Justification must show sanctification. Lack of that is very questionable on whether the gospel is preached or heard or believed. Now that sounds hard, but I'm a grace teacher. That's true. That's 100% true. Because I'm teaching you grace and all is true. Okay? So, you can have people confessing without possessing. And that's why the church is looked at as a household of hypocrites. Now, I'm going to the grace teachers instructs us. John Stott said this, grace the Savior becomes grace the teacher. Isn't that powerful? What does that mean? American Standard says, instructs us. Listen to this. Another translation says, disciplines us. Ooh. Listen to this. Wayman translation. Grace trains us. Another one says, grace schools us. What's he trying to say with that? 
In other words, in our works, our deeds, our thoughts, our motives, our actions, grace then begins to work in our lives, training us, disciplining us, instructing us, uh, constraining us. Grace constrains us to live holy rather than unholy. That's sanctification. So anyone who's experienced the grace of God, for me, this doesn't mean you're experienced. Everybody's experienced it. The way Jesus, Regina came to Christ, totally different mind. I was such a heathen. I needed a high voltage conversion. Jesus just knocked me off. Just knocked me down. I wasn't looking for him. So he invaded my life. Just conquered me. I'm, I'm called the choleric. But I was barking at ministers these assessments. He says that cholerics are, are like that. He looked at his wife when I said one time I was ministering up in North Georgia. I said, I was, I was converted. I had a high voltage conversion. He leaned over right and said, I told you, cholerics have to have a high voltage conversion. <laughs> Jesus had to knock us down. So, grace instructs, disciplines, trains us, schools us. Do you know, let me, let me check, just throw this out. I'm pulling more than I thought. I'll stop giving away public service. They don't want to come here for you to teach them. Grace will instruct them. Grace will discipline. Grace will convict them. Grace will move on their heart to change their life. You know, some people are so stubborn. I'll do it. Ain't it different? I told you about that one guy out in Dallas. He wrote off the back row. He got mad at the church. Saved us for latecomers. Still do. No, <laughs> y'all were here. <laughs> y'all did. Y'all were some of the earliest ones here. They get that reserve seat. Hallelujah. Uh, you, you notice though, we're closer. I am with the chair sometimes. You know what he told folks? He said, I came to Jesus on my own terms. I got up and told the congregation, I said, Look, man, not so. Nobody comes. Lay out your terms to Jesus to get saved or to stay saved. You lay out your terms, you got a big old question mark. And I said that in love. I do. Grace restrains us, constrains us, and controls us. That's the work of the Spirit in your life. Why some people don't want to get close to the Holy Spirit. That's why some people they just like they like knowledge. They, they like they like to know information. I know, I know people, they like to have information. They don't want to get close to the Holy Ghost because he'll wrap up their life. He'll constrain their character. He'll start conforming and working on their character and dig deep until they become high school. They like information. I'm not impressed with information. I like to use the brain to get close to God. Because I want to know my, the God that I serve. Amen? In other words, grace brings ethical demands. It'll put stuff on you. It'll say, there's an outreach. You're going to reach people for the gospel, and all of a sudden you're going to do something. I say, grace, the spirit of grace will come in and say, let's be righteous. That's all I'm saying. Because people need Jesus. This is your only time in the year to get together and reach the community. Do it. Prioritize it. And the spirit of God will come in and convict the people that's in your life. You know, America, the Bible says, trains us to reject godless ways worldly desires, and to live devotedly in this world system. Oh. That's a pretty good verse, isn't it? Listen to this. Grace trains us to reject godless ways, worldly desires, and to live devoutly in this age. And grace in your life. Do you know grace in all its truth? Have you embraced the fullness of God's grace? Or do you just love it? Do you just love the posture? How much you love love in, in full expression of grace? Are you a grace people? Are you a grace people? Has God been placing ethical demands on your life? Say, are you seeking first the kingdom of God? Or are you like an American dream? You lied to us, folks. The gospel isn't the American dream. That's being preached on the victory chapel. <laughs> they've taken the American dream and turned it into the gospel and they've taken the gospel and turned it into the American dream <laughs> I don't know this grace controls you there are things that I wanted to do that the spirit of grace said no to those all of a sudden he began to instruct me and discipline me and restrain me from doing 
I thank God, 68 years old, that I listen most of the time. I've, I've gone on and, and had to repent and turn. But I want you to know, by God's grace, he not only imputed to me sinlessness and believed sinlessness, but now he's saying, I'm in your life. you got to begin to sin less. you got to begin to sin less. you got to begin to sin less. And I'm going to keep digging. I'm going to keep hunting. I'm going to keep pursuing you. You're going to keep wrestling with the song we just sang. Hey, put that first song up, bro. We're going to go home and sing that. And then maybe you can be this. You can tell when God's working on people. Did you know that? You can. Hey, God, you know how to do it. I know there's a distinct facial expression not communicative. Hey, you ask me to do it, though. You know, let me tell you what you do not want your not want. Stand here. Do you know what you don't want to happen? And I wish everybody was here to hear this, but that's okay for you to do it. Do you know what God will do to truly transform Christians? Truly Bible believers. You know what he'll do? This is great speaking. He will thin your Say that again. I don't know if you feel the full impact of that. You say, well, what do you mean? Ask Pharaoh. Give him some stubbornness. You know what he'll do? He will bend your knee. He will say, oh, you're not. <laughs> and he'll say, I am God, there is no other. Oh! Until you bend. That's not fun. You ever done that to you? Adam? Gina? What about you? I don't know what I want to do. <laughs> what I want to do. You get stiff necked. You know that you get stiff necked. He said Israel got stiff necked in their ears. They said, Hide and watch. Take your eye. I'll put you where I want you. But it won't be for life. God will work things at will. It's called the will of God. Say will of God. Will of God. Brothers, come. Help me serve you.